Pastor Jorin and social media glimpses from around the world, 1905 to 1999 exhibition event. Please now, I would like to call Emily for the housekeeping. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, just a few housekeeping bits to start. So can, can we just make sure that all phones are on silent or turned off? There's also no flash photography on it today. Um, if you need the bathroom, you just go out the doors in the exit, walk through the Northwest Gallery, and then the bathroom's on the left. And there isn't a fire alarm plan for this evening, but if one does go off, just make your way to the nearest exit. Um, thank you again for joining us. Our pleasure is to find us. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us this evening and those who are joining us on Zoom. I'm delighted to say this is the first time in two years that all three galleries are with exhibition. This exhibition, which we'll mention this evening, was originally planned for March 2020 and has been on hold for the last two years. So it gives me great pleasure tonight to open posters, the original social media, glimpses from around the world from 1905 to 1999 exhibition tonight. Curated by Mary B. Mullen and Hannah Biles, who we'd like to thank and welcome this evening. This exhibition consists of a selection of posters from the collection of Mary B. Mullen, who is, who is an AUB Honorary Fellow of 2006. For those who don't know, um, for those who don't know what an honorary fellow is, our AUB honorary fellowship is a highly prestigious award that is bestowed upon persons who have connected with the Arts University Bournemouth and that has made a significant contribution to the fields of arts, design, media or performance in a professional capacity or an educational role. The gallery works with courses right across the university on a variety of projects, and we're delighted to work with BA Honours Visual Communications on this occasion. Thank you, Hannah. This exhibition also gives us the opportunity to reflect on our own collection, our own collection, our own collections here at AUB. We have an AUB art collection with over 800 pieces of artwork, which are legacies from lectures, associated artists alumni and acquisitions of student work. Some of our artists include Professor Sir Peter Cook, Philip Townsend, Alan Kitching, Robin Roberta Smith, Martin Brewster, Marcel Lamb, and many, many more. We have also works on loan from the Arts Council Collection England, sculptures on loan from Tim Harrison, and the work of Tony Cragg. And we also have on loan a private collection from John and Barbara Wicks, in addition to these collections, we also have an AUB costume collection, our, sp our special collections, which are housed in the library. This includes our artist books, materials library, Japanese photo library, and visionaria. And obviously, we also have our museum and design and plastics mode of collection, which has recently been designated as an outstanding collection by the Arts Council of England in recognition, in recognition of its national importance. MODIP also looks after Plastics Historical Society collection and the Worshipful Company of Horners collection. The majority of our collections are on public display or can be, a set, be accessed and seen by appointment. With that said, I would now like to take the opportunity to thank the following. I'd like to thank our campus service team for all their support on our projects and all the work we do in the gallery. Many thanks to our AV marketing team, Thanks to Eden Franklin and Alex Greenwich for helping us install the exhibition. A very special thanks to Will and Joe for all their hard work and commitment to our projects and the gallery always. Many thanks to BA Honours Events Management for working, it, with, working with us to stage this event and all their students who work in the gallery on a daily basis. A special thanks to Ollie tonight, he's been trained up on all the digital side. The course is our formal academic partner and plays a major role in the life of the gallery. A very special thanks to our incredible gallery office students, volunteers and placements for all their amazing work. We have Emily, Katie, and many more to mention. Our students are just fantastic and are so talented and professional. Oh yes, Phoebe's here tonight as well, I can't forget Phoebe. <laughs> it's a pleasure to work with you all. Thank you all. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our chair this evening. <clears throat> Professor Paul Goff is our Vice Chancellor and Principal here at the University. Paul is a painter, a broadcaster, 
and author and has, and has exhibited internationally and is represented in permanent collections of the Imperial War Museum London, the Canadian War Museum Mawata, and the National War, Muse National War Memorial New, New Zealand. Along with leading roles in international higher education and global research assessment, his research into the representation of war and peace has been represented to audiences around the world. He has published nine books, including monographs on the British painter Stanley Spencer, Paul and John Nash, and several comprehensive studies of art from both world wars. Over the past decade, he has curated many exhibitions, including Shock and Awe, Contemporary Art and War and Peace, and Brothers in Arms, an exhibition of John and Paul Nash. And most recently, he has curated the exhibition Crossing, to, Crossing the Line with fellow curator Joshua Reed, the exhibition of the street art. <clears throat> and he's also contributed to the company publication. Paul has worked in television for 10 years, appears regularly on UK and global media, and is currently writing his second book about the street artist fantasy. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Goff. Professor. Thank you very much. So we're gonna have a conversation and they're gonna say some wonderful things. Uh, to us all, share some of the insights of the exhibition of the, the artwork and the background to the posters we can see in this terrific exhibition. And then there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, so I might point at a few people and uh, suggest you ask something or raise a point, but no, feel free. We do have an audience here and we do have colleagues online. So uh, looking forward to a lively conversation, but also to hearing so much from Mary and from Hannah about this remarkable show, because when I look at it, you can see that the, the, the themes there, social, political, cultural change, they're there evident on the wall. Um, they were designed, I guess, for public display, but also for competition, for peer approval, and for informing the public. Uh, for exhibition, you can certainly see that they, as it says in the documentation, they inform, they inspire, and they provoke, and they also to a degree warn. And I think the world is a very, very kind of delicate place at the moment. And so the, the, the power of visual communication to warn uh, is, is, is paramount in my mind. But above all, what you can see there is succinct storytelling, really extraordinarily succinct, pithy storytelling at its best. It is the ultimate art of visual communication in its most immediate and universal form. Uh, and it's a treasure to have what is only a portion Mary, of a huge collection uh, in your in your various kind of rooms and under the bed and all those kind of places. So what I'll start by asking really is, is tell us about how the show came about and, and what portion it is of this huge collection that you have. Well, first of all, I think a collection might not be the right term because a collection implies editorial discipline and um, knowledge and uh very selective things. I acquired, was gifted, wished upon me posters when I was fortunate enough to travel around the world and meet with wonderful designers in wonderful places. And um, what do you do when you're gifted with a roll of posters? You run through an airport and it's like a battering ram, you know, and in those, some of the times there was before 9-11 and very high security, so you could shove it up on, on the thing. So these came home and, and they lived with me in my London office. And then I came to Dorset and they were shoved in the attic. And uh, so the collection, I'm calling it an accumulation, Paul. <laughs> um, there's about um, at least three times what we have in the gallery. And with yeah. Hannah helped me to wade through this great collection. And we relating it to Hannah's wonderful work here and the college, we decided that we would not emphasize posters that were originated in this country, although there are some very notable English designers there, but to use posters that perhaps people wouldn't have had the opportunity to see otherwise, and to which perhaps brought out international collaboration and international interpretation. Mm. So, while I was Secretary General of Ecograd and worked with ICSID and the International Council of Industrial Design and other organizations. So 
these posters, that's how they came. In mm -hmm. the days of social media, right, I can gather all my images I'll ever, I don't need to go to a gallery, I can go on Instagram, I can mm -hmm. be overwhelmed by images. But Hannah, what's the, what's the point of posters in the 21st century? I think posters are always going to be very relevant still. Um, just seeing students come and interact with the posters on display, I think ink on paper is always going to be very poignant and very um, kind of, you know, appealing. Mm -hmm. um, we liken it to the, you know, social media be, you know, posters being the original social media. But, um, mm. you know, like you said, we can just go on Instagram, but at a different scale and sometimes very interactive. But again, it's the message. It's about cultural um, times at present. Mm. And that's why we kind of drew the comparison. Mm. But I think posters will always be there, maybe just with different uses. Give us a, a range of what these uses might be. Well, for example, they might be slightly more interactive. They might be kind of more animated now. Again, mm. that's a different type, that type of narrative, a different type of storytelling. But again, the message still needs to be succinct um, and very clear and mm. kind of, you know, engaging from a distance. Mm. So, OK, you know, both of you are, are expert on this topic. And as I said, I was a very, very poor poster maker because I couldn't summarise and, and, and make it concise enough, I mm. think. There's always a danger to have too much going yeah. on. Um, but looking at the range of posters there, and there is a terrific range uh, from all over the country, from all over the last century. Uh, I was trying to think out, what's the ingredients of a good poster? What is it, Mary? What, we'll ask both of you that question. Mm. What is it that makes a, a poster work? For me, I think it's a very strong image that somehow mm. draws you into the image, first of all. Mm. It, speaks to you there because and then you begin to read what it is about it um, and I think some of the posters there the graphic designers have brilliantly interpreted somebody else's culture and presented it in their own language we have um, the Polish designers interpreting what the uh, Orient is about and there's just one wonderful image of Oriental artists mm. exhibition in Poland. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, my probably favorite one is Madame Butterfly, uh, Madame Butterfly and the wonderful opera, which is Italian music. It's a Japanese American story and it was presented in Czech. And there is one image and I hope you all like it as much as I do, but it is such a strong image that uh, it, it, to me, it speaks of everything that the opera is about. You can almost hear the music. In it. So is that because that one image is really quite stripped down? It's, it's a, the, lot, the, the white paper's doing a lot of work in that, that poster, isn't it? The words don't matter in it, yeah. except for the heading. You see Madame a Butterfly, and then you see the butterfly, mm. and then you see the, that also represents the obi. Mm. And then you see the sword, mm. which is the downfall mm. and the tragedy. So just picking up on that, at what point do the words matter more than the design, than the icon, than the imagery that's on there? I think the words only begin to matter after you're drawn into the image. Mm. Because if you think of cinema posters long ago, people mm. used to stand outside the cinema. The first thing would be next week's Mm. Uh, film would be put up in the cinema mm. so they would you would look at the image and maybe people would recognize the actors or the people mm. or the photographs and then they might read what time was it on or where it was or whatever mm. uh, my favorite sort of memory of posters is is myself is of circus posters um you know, the circus came to town mm. and posters appeared on the lampposts and they were the ones that you know the, the lettering you, you had Morag Mariskov here a little while ago mm. and her background is all circus lettering and that circus lettering was so distinct you knew mm. by just the lettering mm. and the shape of the poster that that was about the circus the mm. excitement of that and so I think it's it's the color and the image that says more than the letters in the beginning because if you look at any of those posters that I think we've chosen, uh, the mm -hmm. image speaks more because they're in Hungarian, Czech, Spanish, Italian. Yeah. Uh, the, the image speaks more than the poster. Mm. We'll come back to those, uh, those ideas in a moment. But Hannah, going to your work with the students, which do they 
tussle with the most the 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 font the words the message or the image i mean it's an impossible answer but i'm just kind of curious yeah i think i think it do. depends i think it's all i think normally it's, it's the game of the copy first in the, yeah. the the content and then it's kind of like i think a lot of students i'll speak to you, speak for you guys but use a poster to kind of explore their idea to kind of test the idea the valid and um, you know whether it's a valid idea they may not even print them you may just sort mm. of, you know, they may just be digital components at the end, mm. but but it, it tests whether it works in the ba in the basic kind of text, image, message, maybe a logo. Mm. And I think that's how they're kind of used for- Do they students. do the work willingly? Do they think the poster is relevant as an Yeah, exercise? I mean, yeah, we still work, yeah, yeah. Posters are still quite often one of the mm. components, yeah, definitely, mm. yeah. Someone mentioned recently that when we do events here, we do a great many events of all sorts, you know, productions, theatre, uh, a big, big event last week at Winchester Cathedral with our choir, which was um, streamed live and 10,000 people watched it. So it reaches huge audiences. But we do a lot of events on, on location, on site, giving students practical experience and live, live briefs. But actually, once you put a poster up, people are automatically drawn to it and see it. So it has a value in a day when yeah. you think that it is going to be all um, telematic or, or digital. But if you think of not even undesigned posters, if you like, not mm. design out posters, mm. any television programme now where there's a protest, that people have a mm. carrier placard mm. and there might be two words on that mm. um, or an image on it, mm. usually very badly lettered, but, <laughs> but it, they, people fight to get that in onto the camera rather than what they're saying. Yeah, well, let's touch on that because we mentioned beforehand we were talking about some of the posters. Look at the ones from Japan. Look at the ones, the eco posters, thirty years before Greta came around. What, what they, they do have that sense of a of a political and edginess to them. So, give us some examples of how you think that's why that happens and how it works, and give us some examples from this exhibition about the political edge that you can see. Maybe there's a longevity and good design, Paul. Mm. I don't know. Maybe. The topics are human and mm. humanity doesn't change. Mm. But certainly looking at the peace posters, which are extraordinarily mm. strong image, mm. because the Japanese designers after the war, what can a designer or an artist or a, anybody do in the face of absolute horrors? And we're all thinking about this a little bit at the present moment, mm. a lot more. And uh, you, the designers in Japan got together and instead of bewailing what had happened, they said, let's come together and make images which are about peace. Mm. And so they invited designers from all over the world and their own country to create peace images. Mm. And the two posters we have, one from 1988 and one from 1989, mm. suddenly 30 plus years later, Mm. speak today mm. um, the one that you mentioned about environmental design mm. that was created by probably one of the great graphic designers of the mid 20th century in the UK one of a great group of mid-European designers who fled to Britain uh, to escape the war in Europe uh, the, and this one was by FHK Henry and who's corporate work many people would know mm. but but there were people like uh, Lewis Woodhouse and Willie DeMaio who formed, was one of the founders of the uh, International Council of Graphic Design these people came to here but that poster was by Henry uh, Henri Henry and he was chairman of the student seminar which the Icarati used to run in Leicester Square Theatre and 2000 seater cinema in those days and he uh, chose the subject, subject of environmental design and he had designers from uh, I think the United States certainly Japan and a few other places to mm. speak about environmental design and that was boy when we unrolled it mm. we just looked at it and said you know we'd forgot I'd forgotten about it mm. and there it was so relevant still so the great issues are still with us Paul I think yeah. and some of the topics are there and so if it's a good design and a strong image it lasts. So would that explain that quite a few of the more, uh, more extraordinary posters are from that Eastern European fringe, you know, we see Czechoslovakia, yeah. we see Polish, uh, Yugoslavian posters across there, places of some political turmoil. Is the relationship between the, the 
the, the sort of the strength and the energy of those posters and the kind of circumstances they've been produced in? I th yeah, I think it's just um, the printing process. It's very immediate. It's very quick. Um, you can get your message ac across. Right? And so I think it's also that as well. And I think mm. it's shown um, within the posters. So what can the print one, before it's been married, what can the print one would be done for some of those Polish... I don't know in terms of amount. Do you mean thousands amount? Possibly. Thousands, possibly. Yeah, mm. thousands. Yeah. Mm. I mean, some if you know, th th we've done so much research as well during this this period, yes. um, and just seeing the collections now, um, mm. it's just really interesting that the the variety as mm. well and subject matter is is incredibly broad in terms yeah, of Eastern true. Europe, especially Poland. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Check. Hannah has done some brilliant research on it, but partly, as I understand it, Paul, um, the Having a poster exhibition when this is, would be more for peer approval than for information uh, gathering. The uh, great Biennales mm -hmm. in places, the first really big one of those was in Bruno in Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. started by a wonderful man called Jan Reilich and then taken on by his son, Jan Junior. And he was able, even under the political circumstances, that existed to invite designers from all over the world mm. to submit posters. And it was a way, if you like, uh, of people exchanging information and sending messages to mm. um, in a more subtle way. And then the other Biennales followed, the great one in, in uh, Lati in Finland, we have one from there. I don't have any of the ones from Mexico in the Biennale in Mexico or or the ones in Chaumont in France, and these have been copied. But it was really the Eastern Europeans, a way of bringing designers together mm -hmm. to do things and have these great exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've touched on the on the political uh, uh, and the fact they can represent and reflect on the turmoil. How about switching it on its head, really, in terms of the commercial projects with humour? I was thinking Savignac's work there, mm. I mean, they, they immediately kind of... Yeah, they just, they're really impressive. And I mm. think, you know, he's built a, a, a huge collection of his work. Um, mm. I mean, I personally thought they you know, really um, work really well in the exhibition because they do contrast as well with other posters. Mm. Um, the scale isn't huge, but the messages are always really kind of, no, nice. there's not, um, they're really humorous. Yes, um, and the illustrative work mm. is, and hand-drawn mm. type as well, mm. is what, the way it works with the commercial project is quite unusual. Mm. Um, and, you know, he's well known for kind of managing to kind of um, look at imagery in a really, um, yeah. unusual way <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they're very varied aren't they there's not, yeah. almost like not a house style with those particular images no not really mm. again it's just it's their commercial as well mm. so yeah mm. They even buck the house style of Hermes. I mean, the Hermes, Hermes yeah. is a very strict mm -hmm. house style. I mean, you recognise a Hermes <laughs> project anyway. Mm -hmm. They did keep the actual writing of the word Hermes, sure. but he, he absolutely the threw out the images and mm -hmm. created a sort of almost cartoon mm -hmm. interpretation of them. I think as well, as, you know, by using the horse, you know, mm -hmm. some people may not recognise the brand from like, saddle, you know, from leather work. And so it's about kind of, well, educating the audience, I think, as well. Sure. Talking of audience, I'll be coming to people in a minute if anyone mm -hmm. has any questions. So feel free to, to chip in. One thing that interests me, my background is as a practitioner in fine art, and I know how difficult it is to arrive at a, a, as a very pithy economic kind of use of an image. And take this one here, for instance. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you how do you how do students understand how to condense something so it is so powerful? The iconography conveys a, 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 you know in a busy environment that it's that it's singular, not least the kind of lilac that's been used in the background. But how is that done? It is challenging, definitely. Mm. Um, mm. Posters are not are not easy to design. Mm. I don't. I think that then it's sometimes about knowing your subject matter, kind yeah. of um, mm -hmm. getting the copy correct, you know, and very succinct and, and really clear, um, and also not being too for me too fussy. Yeah. Some of the the best posters are the are the simplest. You yeah. know, there's one out there that we only put in very re recently for Memphis um, oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, for the Boiler House and it is as, as, as contemporary today so, as it yeah. was mm. you know, mm -hmm. 30, yeah and, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah years ago it, it could have been in today's with today's audience sure. and it was just a, it's just a, some shelves from the exhibition mm -hmm. um, in an illustrious way and when you know the exhibition when you when you when you understand the work mm -hmm. it's it's just a really simple but effective sure. way of showcasing information mm -hmm. yeah. what, goes, what goes wrong in a poster when it doesn't work and you think oh it's just not 
I think well, it's just works. too difficult. I think if people walk past yeah, it, you just yeah, walk yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. if it doesn't arrest you, yeah. um, I think there has to be a quality of arresting. And yeah. actually, it was much in the last few days working with the wonderful team in the gallery. It was wonderful how people, because yeah. it's a, it's yeah. a, such a good position in the university here, people use it as a thoroughfare, which is, was designed to be. Yeah. And they'd walk past, and then suddenly you'd see people put on the brakes and they'd yeah. look. Yeah. And it the big images did stop people sure. and do that and different images appealed to I was going to say different ones for different people yeah. but it was yeah. also the emotive ones because I remember looking at the um Pompidou Centre one for the student halls wasn't it yeah, or student um house and it was just that nostalgic feel as well mm. that kind of real emotive quality that posters give you mm. um mm. that isn't replaced by anything else I think mm. I think it's image Mm. Strong image. I think it looks great, by the way. Thank the you. Looks really good, so that's Thanks. great. Um, I'm just interested to sort of, uh, know how you hope students will use the exhibition to kind of feed mm. into their own pra practice. So I'll just okay. repeat that because people online might find that. Thank you very much. It's how, does, how will students who see this exhibition, students not just from this university, but certainly many, many schools and colleges we work with, will be brought in and invited in to work with us and to see uh, the exhibition. And how, how might they respond to it and use it either in their own work or as a way of, of mm. broadening their horizons? I think in lots of, I think in loads of different ways. I think first of all, being an international um, exhibition um, I think is really great because so many people are just used to seeing stuff on you know these posters online to actually see them physically the scale the size is quite you know um, impressive but also in terms of recognizing how to create your own I think as well in terms of when you when you first got your initial idea how to um, how to tell that story um, in a quick um, but effective mm -hmm. way and I think a lot of the posters but I, I hope really they're just really inspiring Mm. For, for for students ultimately um mm. i think that's that's mm. the hope i hope the international context yeah. too because there's a very international student body here now yes, indeed. Yeah. and i hope that that sort of has relevance yeah. as well sure and uh we've yeah. had some interesting conversations Definitely, with some yeah. of the people that have walked yeah. through over 20 percent of our students will be international it's, uh, so it's genuinely a kind of, uh, we've got global citizens yes. across uh, from all parts of the world. Anything else people would like to ask? Yes, there's one in the middle, then one at the back. My name is Roger. Um, when I was a young boy, going back to Leicester Square, the only Leicester Square, occasionally my mother would take me to see various films, and two posters always stand out in my brain. One was Around the World in 80 Days with David Niven. And as you so rightly say, Hannah, kind of, it conveys a picture of what you're going to see with a globe. And the other was Bridge on the River Kwai. Straight away, you can sum up what the film's going to be out about. Mm -hmm. And also they had the sort of poster on the poster, the stars as well. And it gave you instant gratification for me. You know, I'm a big young boy, yeah. I was excited. And I wasn't going to see the film. And that does all conjured up in that one big poster by the Odinus mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's lots of, you have to convey a great deal. You also have to live up to the promise, don't you, when yeah. it's about promotion <laughs> yeah, yeah, proposition? It's about yes. Because it's there forever. If you, well, it's the come plot. hither, isn't it, for, yes, the, it for the event. If it's an event, yeah. it's it's the one, as Roger says, creates the excitement. Mm, indeed. So there's one in the back, then I'll come to Mary. Yep. Um, yes, I was just going to share that when I was growing up, I remember the Athena. Oh, yes. Yeah. I don't know. If yeah. Know Wait, I think we talked about it. It was very much about art being accessible mm. to a new generation mm. affordable and for me that's a big part of poster and the design of course you've got the message but you've also got the audience that then can appreciate and collect it mm -hmm. um, so my question is do you still feel there is a place that poster art and design plays in making Design and art accessible to the masses and affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I shall. Uh, no, go ahead. Question for Ah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a long one. Uh, you expect me to be concentrating? Uh, <laughs> I was on the, I'm about, trying to get the answer, let alone the question. Uh, it's really about relevance, isn't it? And and making sure that the that the work has uh, an afterlife and a relevance yeah. beyond its immediate kind of impact. I mean, I think uh, we were talking about Athena yesterday, weren't yeah. we? And um, just kind of being nostalgic, really. But um, uh, there's so many um, 
places now where you can almost um, print to order your mm. your posters and it gives you so much creative freedom with your space I think and also um, the messages you want to convey in your house or in your space um, I think kind of allow it allows you that opportunity so I think there is a space for things to, ch to change but I think it gives you more ownership of the posters does that make sense the question um, is interesting just because the question is really about Athena being a kind of timepiece as much as anything mm. have, you, have you still got your Athena posters gosh I might have some <laughs> anyway, gosh, I have to, I have to but the, there's another question attached to that which I'll come back to which is they're not meant to last are they they're no ephemeral essentially yeah, yeah. So I think it's quite interesting in terms of they, they they have last, they become art pieces in their own right. Athena represents a particular kind of period, doesn't it? Yeah. In everyone's collecting history and how you kind of decorate your own walls. Okay, thank you. I think Mary, you had your hand up. Yeah, just um, being competitive. Um, which country does the best? <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was there an Irish edge to that then? No, I, I don't think there are any Irish countries. Yeah, there are. Well, are there? I don't know. <laughs> I have to check them out. But do you have a view as to? Are there which 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 uh, countries produce the most striking or the most memorable or the ones with striking, the? Most striking. Yeah. Yeah. Most striking. Do you want to? I think, on balance, one would say the Eastern European mm. people have. Mm. Yeah. But. This is, can also largely because they wished to communicate, might be partly because they wished to communicate to an audience that mightn't understand their languages. Mm. Before English became so well known mm. uh, and the common language of so many countries, um, images again worked so much better. And, but I think even in, you'd know more about this in the filmmaking and animation, it was always the Czech and the Polish mm -hmm. um, animation. They also had a great tradition in that area as well. Sure. I mean, what's interesting from that question there is that actually some of the images don't travel internationally. I was thinking of the two, just outside here, the three, one has got an umbrella, Radovan Jenko, 1991. Yes, yeah. Some of them seem so locked in their own particular kind of, uh, geography or their psychology or their their kind of political context mm -hmm. uh, and they yeah. don't travel i don't mind that i think it's really quite they're extraordinary pieces in their own right yeah. whereas the dove in the japanese pieces is a national icon Absolutely. international yeah. icon yeah but sometimes they don't for me travel beyond the confines of the poster but that doesn't make them any less as artwork mm. yeah and they're uh, very much locked mm. as you say on a in a period of time mm. or in a fashion mm. for an art form mm. if it slavishly follows mm. on the fashion mm. um it, it dates very quickly yeah i like that don't mind that mm. please sally um i saw when i was a student posters we all collected them and also they were a big part of my political awakening um, and then you look back on people like David Gentleman mm. and all the protest movement and designers doing so much to support those movements and change things. Yeah. I don't know if you, I feel a bit disappointed today that perhaps a lot of these designers aren't necessarily giving their voice to political or mm. social causes. I don't know what you both thought. Mm. So just to paraphrase Sally's question, and I, I'm, I agree with you in many ways, Sally, is that our current round of designers are not maybe using the poster for more edgy material, political ends, uh, of mass communication towards making particular points. Perhaps they've stood away from that. Mm -hmm. um, but have they gone decorative? Have they gone bland? Uh, is the poster not the vehicle for it might, I was going to say, it might not be the vehicle. It might be that mm -hmm. it's gone maybe more Digital. through social media, mm -hmm. um, more than the printed poster. But I think like Occupy movement. I think there was quite a few more posters mm. within that time. Mm. Um, maybe more recently. Again, that was what two thousand eight was it two thousand nine? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I have to get my dates. Post, yeah. um, but I think maybe now it's kind of is going through more social media channels, possibly. Um, but mm. that's my. Well, I think digital is becoming the thing, yeah. but mm. but that's in a way so personal, isn't it? Mm. The poster brings people together, if you mm. like. There's a common, they mm. share a common image. I know you can do that by social mm. media, but there, you don't get the same reaction mm. with it. Mm. I was just thinking of, you know, posters, people collect to them. And I believe the great symbol of the fact that you had gone on a foreign holiday when cheap mm. package deals came in, everybody had a bullfighter program yeah. in, yes, in the, the bedroom yeah. because that was 
you know, you'd been to Spain for your holidays. Mary Mullen Tormalinos. <laughs> There's always that. I imagine it would have been. I guess the other one picking up that point is that they, the poster historically was about advertising. I mean, there was a period when I was writing one of my books around the First World War that apparently uh, posters surrounded every single billboard in Trafalgar Square, recruiting posters yeah. or buying government bonds. Mm -hmm. And ta uh, number 10, uh, white in, in Downing Street would be signing off and agreeing posters, you know, 10, 15 a day. They were seen as the only way of, of mass communication, of advertising. But picking up the point about political edginess, the posters that are produced as placards for, for um, you name it, for protests, for uh, some sort of disturbance or, or a, a sense of upheaval, they are another form of poster, mm -hmm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're probably, they're much more ephemeral, they're probably not kept. They still serve the same. Well, purpose. posters were meant to be put. They were pasted on mm. advertised. That, you know, there's the image everywhere of the mm. man on the ladder with mm. the paste brush sure. putting up the, and then it was torn down. Sure. And next week's poster was put <coughs> up at the next event. But um, it's interesting. You've just reminded me all those Second World War posters mm. that people like Henry and, and mm. Abram Games and all of these people mm. created. They've come back. They you get keep calm and carry on. Mm. Is now a slogan on all sorts of things. So those slogans have come yes, back indeed. again. Yes, um, Uncle Sam needs you. That's, mm. you know, been used in so many different sure. ways. Yeah. And it's fun, I think, to see Margaret Calvert's mm. um, iconic road designs, which have lasted since 1961. Alan Fletcher having fun with them mm. in his uh, poster yes. outside. Yes, and of course, indeed. Margaret's an honorary fellow here indeed. as well. And, Anything else people would like to raise? Yes, please. Hi. Um, apologies if this was answered earlier. My brain just came online. Uh, but since this, uh, since it spans a hundred years or so, have there been any like visual trends that have stuck out to you over that century? It's a great question around visual mm. trends over a century of work. What what's persistent in terms of those visual iconographical trends? Do you think? I mean, I think. The printing process has definitely had a had a mm -hmm. you know has changed um significantly in terms of like the color um you know you look at some of the japanese peace posters beautifully printed mm -hmm. jack london very basic mm -hmm. um you know you know with letterpress sort of origins so i think that's had a massive you know um knock-on effect with trends but a lot of that we were saying a lot of the posters have hand-drawn typography yes. it's not necessarily a trend but it's something that is is, is continuing mm -hmm. um and I think that all that gives you it gives it that emotive quality. I think hand drawn type um, that mm. again the poster is is known for the immediacy. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Mm. I'm just thinking about where you display the now. Like, mm. How will mm. opportunities to display posters? Because we used to. So like I design advertising campaigns. We have to pay for a billboard. We pay for yeah. a poster mm. on the bus stop. There are, it doesn't feel like there's as many opportunities to just like. Slap posters all over the walls so you don't own anymore. So the question yeah. around I think that has changed is how easy it is to display posters. Yeah, the question about how you display, how you afford. I mean, the the dimensions reach from fly posting, which is a form of guerrilla kind of uh, artwork, mm -hmm. right through to paying for the the underground. And is that a form of poster in the underground? But what about mm -hmm. display opportunities? Do they exist? I, I mean, I think in terms of commercial posters, they're not as it's not as popular you know yeah. now um but social media social, yeah i gotta say social media <laughs> and other and other forms but i think in terms of like posters for your for yourself your you know for space mm. i think it's still that like a lot of design agencies now um actually sell a lot of their posters a lot of their art mm. um and that's and that's actually more popular than some of the commercial yeah, so commercial like, jobs like homes, yeah mm. yeah <laughs> exactly it's just a different you know but I think it's still they're still used in some countries because in some countries where there's elections, you'll still mm -hmm. find government posters with the face of the yeah. um, person that's putting themselves up for election and the party underneath it. And you'll find uh, lampposts and everything littered with these posters. And that's still happening in many countries. That's very true, because we're just thinking of here, maybe, but actually yeah. like in places like Brazil, yes. where it's very yeah. immediate, you know, quick, you know, the the... And there's a relationship between uh, the urban literacy and the ability for people to to understand quite complicated ideas as opposed to a motif on a poster. Is there any correlation? Yeah. Question to answer. Well, we're all illiterate if we don't know the language. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you see a Japanese poster with Japanese language, yeah. I'm illiterate. 
Mm-hmm. But if the image speaks to me, mm-hmm. then it conveys it. So it's language is an interesting yeah, visual language, too true. Things it's 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 where the image can be very powerful and to uh, mm-hmm. uh, have a message. And if you're working internationally now, as I say, English is is probably English and Spanish and maybe Chinese. Mm-hmm. But um, I think. That that's the the image carries it. Indeed. Question, please. The image when I was young, the image of the I don't know which election, maybe the nineteen seventy nine general election here. Labour isn't working with a long queue of unemployed people, and that was easily translated to to the voters. And Margaret Thatcher won the election. Yeah, so these are all the queue of people in the poster yeah, who were actually from, yeah, they, they were all from the advertising agency yeah. standing in that queue, apparently. <laughs> um, that's the Sanchi poster. It goes back again to the question yeah. of what point does the poster become the advertising <coughs> hoarding? Because you could argue, you know, the huge hoardings that we have mm. uh, by the firm, I can never remember the name, but uh, not Pearl and Dean, but something like that. Um, at what point is that a poster or is that a, a paid space? Mm-hmm. But you're right, it's a very memorable, the extraordinary memorable image. Mm-hmm. Uh, and which, which in terms of memorable images, you think you will walk away from that exhibition and think that is one I will never forget as an image? Yeah, I think probably for, the piece for me. For me. Well, I'm too probably close to it. I mean, I know my favourites, yeah. but but um, and uh, I've mentioned but Madame and Butterfly. Yeah. But uh, looking again, I mean, I I think the the Polish one is very strong, and I'm very moved by the Japanese sure. uh, images on that. Yeah. yeah, for me, the peace posters I think are really. Um, but uh, this may be the time and the place. Yes, yeah, it, it, yeah. We respond. True. This is more of a comment for you, actually, Mary, from Marcus uh, online. Or you to... Yeah, from Marcus Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mary, for being your own poster for Ukraine, appreciated by those of us with family there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Colours travels a long way. Roger, back to you. Just, uh, what the gentleman was saying there about how a poster, in a few words, to sum up that whole thing. When I was a young boy again, watching all the last of marches. Yes, past, indeed. And the poster said, ban the bomb. Yeah, yeah, sure. Long explanation is yeah. three words. Yeah. Down the bottom. Yeah. Sums it up really in one thing, one sentence. Mm-hmm. That might be a powerful end to bring this to a kind of uh, to a conclusion. There's plenty more we could. It's amazing you can have such a great conversation about the, the poster, which is you know could be parked as being something that belonged to the past, but is alive and kicking in in Viscom here in graphic design and in the um the kind of the, the visual literacy of, of our students and our graduates. So thank you very much for the conversation. We hope you can join us as we go into the exhibition, have a drink, have a conversation, and and applaud Hannah and Mary for a a phenomenal bit of work in terms of bringing this collection together for AUB. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, And thank you, Mary, for, you know, educating um, and inspiring me, and also just letting me into your house and kind of just (laughs) just having a lot of fun with, you know, going through the poster archive that you have. It's been brilliant. Um, thank you, Violet, um, for matchmaking us yeah, as well. So um, so luck. And Will for help, all your help. And Eden and Alex um, for helping hang. And Joseph um, for all the design work. <laughs> Lots of thank yous, but thank you, everyone. <laughs> and Viscom team, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for all the students. And we hope the gallery and the university. Well, thank you for chairing the team.